I'm Johnny Hart, and you're listening to the Market Insights Market Pulse podcast. Let's join our guests for Friday afternoon. It's Oanda Senior Market Analyst Craig Earlham in London and Trader Nick in the United States. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hey, Johnny. It's been an absolutely fascinating week and a bit of a turbulent one as well when we consider how things have changed over the world. Of course, the big stories were the Fed's announcement on Wednesday, followed by the Bank of England and the ECB on Thursday. But uh, Nick, I wanted to come to you first. The quite dovish uh, statements from the Federal Reserve that we saw on Wednesday uh, afternoon, there's a little bit of perspective change, isn't there? Because we've had some comments from Fed member John Williams today. He's the New York Fed president, and uh, they're a bit more hawkish. Yeah, and and I want to. Uh, I thought this was something worth bringing up on the podcast today when we we're doing our notes for this because uh, we had a really smash hit win, I guess, for the equities bulls, the dollar bears, because we heard from Jerome Powell. Of course, we covered on Wednesday extensively the idea that rate cuts are coming. This, I think, uh, shows something that's important when it comes to looking at the Fed as a whole. It's made up of many people, and also with many people, you get many opinions. Uh, I just wanted to bring attention to this because um, a lot of people seem to be all up in arms about, you know, oh, so there's some disagreement. You have to remember Jerome Powell, he is kind of the, he's the, he's the big shot. He has to kind of speak on behalf of the entire Fed, the the he's kind of the consensus guy. So you do get these opinions that get thrown out there. I believe this happened on CNBC's Squawk Box, and during this this particular um, comment, uh, basically calling rate cut uh, in March premature. The market did react to that. We've seen that we saw the dollar poke up a little bit here this morning. Um, it's back down here now, and I just want to kind of point out, you know, whenever you get these sort of comments coming across. The desk. You just have to be a little bit careful because you have to remember the Fed is made up of many people with many opinions. And I think at the end of the day, Jerome Powell has the most um, importance when it comes to speaking because he does speak in on behalf of kind of the consensus, the overall. So I think that it still stands overall. The the dovish sounding Fed is still intact for now. Dollar is back down, like I said, trading at 102.39 at the time of us recording this. Uh, we've had a ton of other data also to move to as well. And uh, on our last podcast, when Craig and I went over, uh, of course, the Fed, we also talked just how important uh, the ECB and the um, the Bank of England would be to follow. This morning, we did get some PMI numbers out of Europe, which seemed slow. We also saw um, kind of a mix to, to, to slightly better than expected out of the UK for manufacturing and services PMI. Um, and then we had some US PMI numbers, which also were a tad bit mixed. But Craig, I wanted to ask you about this because we did kind of uh, load a spring on this topic on Wednesday. Um, this data, the PMI data first, then your reaction, I guess, to uh, what happened with the Bank of England and ECB. What's going through your head right now? Because I'm really curious. So the data that we've had today and uh, recently in general is quite consistent. And the message that we're getting from the data is consumers, households and businesses view uh, interest rates to be falling next year and they are seeing inflation falling already and expect that to continue and that's important because it means that the uh, borrowing costs are obviously lower which will ease the burden that comes with higher and uh and unsustainable borrowing costs but also uh borrowing costs which you don't know where the ceiling is which is the scariest part of when interest rates are rising it's known where they're going to stop so knowing that they have stopped and that they're actually on the way down it's naturally going to boost confidence and uh, the wage growth element i think is important too even if households probably aren't feeling it that much at this point because we've had two years of an income squeeze i think there is going to be a case of at least they know it's happening and they'll start to feel better off over time so we are seeing sentiment improving from both a consumer and household and a business perspective and we actually got data alluding to that today not just the pmi the pmi was much better the services pmi in particular jumped above 52 so 50 might be in the market that separates growth and contraction uh 
so the services PMI for the UK jumped to 52.7 from 50.9. It was only expected to nudge higher to 51. And again, that's important for two reasons. One is that's not just into growth territory, but that's substantially into growth territory and very much runs counter to what we've seen elsewhere in Europe. But also at the same time, the services industry accounts for more than three quarters of the entire UK economy. So it's incredibly important. So when the manufacturing uh, PMI is at 46.4, it's far less important. It's around 10% of the UK economy. Ideally, you want both to be strong, but if one has to be strong, you want that to be a services. The rest of the euro area was very weak, well below 50 uh, and still in a lot of trouble, probably in recession already. The other UK number we had this morning was the GFK consumer confidence and that improved slightly too. So it's not just businesses that are feeling better, it is households. And that went from minus 24 to minus 22. A number below zero is still pessimistic, but the UK people are very pessimistic. In the last 15 years, we've had around 18 months when we've had numbers above zero. So we are a very pessimistic bunch of people, but we are increasingly less pessimistic over the course of the last 12 months. And this is actually the best number that we've had barring two months ago when it was also around this level uh, since uh, late 2021. So we are very much on the mend uh, and getting not too far now from levels that we were seeing say 2016 through 20. 20 uh, from a consumer confidence perspective so that should start to filter through to the data again maybe sign here that the uk could be heading to avoid a, re a narrow recession uh, rather than fall into one and i the question now which you've alluded to uh, in your question is what influence does that have on the bank of england because uh, obviously we heard from them yesterday yeah, I want to uh, just also point out too that there was something that I that I looked at I thought was interesting with the MPC official bank rate votes, uh, seemingly a little bit more hawkish, right? Because I, I uh, was looking through the numbers and I, I see three people voted for uh, a rate hike, zero for a rate cut, uh, and six for for holding i thought that was kind of interesting and that was uh it's green on forex factory which kind of indicates it was more hawkish than expected um and this is a this is a divergence i guess from what we saw from from the fed we saw a pretty uh, obviously very dovish sounding jerome powell i wonder what that does to the currency world i mean the pound uh traded up pretty strong yesterday <clears throat> It's coming down a little bit here today with the, the slight pop on the dollar that we got. Uh, but I think of the three, of the three big ones that we talk about so frequently, the UCB, the Fed, uh, Bank of England. Uh, is it fair to say that it looks like the Bank of England is kind of the slowest to turn the ship right now, Craig? Yeah, I think they've got the least evidence that the ship is turning and therefore they have to maintain this approach. I think I, I, I would say I was slightly surprised at how hawkish they are because we've seen such considerable improvement over the course of the last couple of months in the economic data uh, that I did think that maybe there was scope for slightly less hawkish. And the fact that we had that 0.3% contraction uh, reading for GDP in October, suggesting that households are still not feeling confident enough to actually spend the cash. The surveys are improving, but the spending patterns are still uh, pretty subdued. Uh, I thought that maybe we'd see slightly less hawkishness from the Bank of England. But I think we have to remember that with the BOE, it's, we've got three very different tales from the Fed to the BOE to the ECB. We've obviously covered the Fed. But from the BOE's perspective, they don't release forecasts this month. And I think that's a massive thing. The ECB and the Federal Reserve both release new economic forecasts. The mm. Fed is forced to publish a dot plot where it has to express its views on interest rates. They then hold a press conference after. From the Bank of England, we get a statement and an interest rate decision in February is when we get the new forecast. So it was always unlikely that we were going to see a pivot to the scale of the ECB or the Fed from the Bank of England this time, not just because the data is still a little bit lagging behind so they don't have the evidence, but they, they're also just not armed with fresh forecasts. So. While I was a bit surprised by the Bank of England, I don't think it's the end of the world and I, I, I don't think it's really indicative of what we can actually expect from them over the course of the next 12 months. And I think that's clear as well from the market's perception because despite the fact that there was no votes for a rate cut and three votes for a rate hike, which was identical to the last meeting, markets are still positioned at this point in time for a full 100 basis points of rate cuts from the Bank of England uh, next year, starting uh, around the summer. So markets still think that nothing's changed regardless of that vote. 